go to stay with Uncle Jack and learn how to paint, and you're in this village on a, uh, and you slept in the chicken coop. <laughs> yeah, the chicken coop. When I arrived, there was no electricity, uh-huh. and so we had gas for like a warm, a warm shower and gas for cooking. Mm-hmm. We had there was no electricity. He eventually got solar lights. But, yeah, you was just in nature. You had a stream below you, so you went swimming in the stream. And the, and the villages, the one below us called Arches, was uh, all cut off from everybody. So there was a lot of inbreeding going on down there. But <laughs> they're just they're <laughs> going, going, to the, going to a disco in Ar- Arches was a unique experience, to say the least. <laughs> they had a little disco down there. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. But yeah, it was just it was it was as as pri- not primitive, but it was just life as simple as it gets. I mean, the guys just worked the farms, the seasons. Yeah, so I went through all four seasons. So I saw the winter. I arrived in the winter, and then the spring, and then the crops with the olives, and the grapes, and the raisins, and the oranges, and the corn for the horses. And so I saw four seasons. And so that was really magical. I mean, it, it just changed my life. It did change your life. It's always always been a great part of your story. And one of the questions that TJ asked is she asked, um, you know, you talk more about that style of art. You gave it a term, and I don't remember what it was. You gave it a term. A la, la prima. A la prima, which is, I guess, a French word for just done first. You you do it just first. Like, this, this is it. You don't uh, el- elaborate on it. We used, to do, we used to do this study where you'd paint a picture in 15 minutes. You'd go, okay, here's your, like, a still life. Do it in 15 minutes and don't screw around with it. Just go for it. And that, that, that style always stuck with me. Like, do it quick. Do it without thinking about it. Just do it. For 15 minutes, and that would be the, and it usually came out really good, really pretty exceptional. So, what did you use for female models? Every everybody always wants to hear the story about how you got beautiful women to take and come and sit down and to model and to be depicted by an artist. It is the absolute, um, absolute dream of people, which is probably too too grand of a dream for most people to hope to obtain, but talk about that. Talk about the models. Talk about the class getting together and painting the models. Oh, there's naked ladies laying, laying all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding you. No, it would just be someone would just sit down. They would they have their clothes on. We didn't do any uh, nude modeling when I was mm-hmm. there. And it was just... <laughs> Uh-huh. So paint a nice picture, though. Oh, yeah, you're working it. Was, yeah, the first time I saw Jack, I told you as a little kid, I thought I was going to walk on him painting a naked lady, you know, when I was like five years old. When he's living in Laguna Beach, I go, oh, no, he's going to be fine. In the back of my mind as a little kid, he's going to be painting a naked lady when I get there. So I guess that's yeah. sort of a artist cliche or artist thing. But no, you just pick out, yeah, people would model, people would sit still. That was the whole thing, just sit still. Um, it wasn't it okay. very? Was it, wasn't wasn't very. Was there anything more than that? Okay, so, um, so you and I kind of have an unusual story together. We met. We were working. Um, we became friends. Um, we became friends really kind of gradually. <laughs> uh, we were working together for a long time. I don't think that we met outside of work for. I think we knew each other for a couple of years before we ever made uh, made a time to see each other outside of work. I think the first time we did that is when we took a trip and went up to Universal um, City Walk. But you know, talk about that. Talk about that journey as an artist using the inspiration from psychics in order to motivate you. You have a simian crease in your left hand, a modified simian crease in your left hand. And a simian crease means you take what's in your heart to your head, so what comes out of your mouth is logical, when in fact you're an intense, passionate, all-or-nothing human being, and you want somebody to make sense of your emotions for you. Simians are always capable of acts of genius, 
one in 10,000 people has a single simian, one in 100,000 is a double simian, and a simian uh, has a struggle with their placement because they go through the early part of their life trying to understand where can they demonstrate their assets, their talents, their capabilities, their strengths, and receive recognition for that. And then when they do find their placement, it's usually in their 40s. And so you learn this style of painting, which was very rapid and very effective, um, but then you had a place for it, a real need in the world for it in painting weddings. And so talk about that just a little bit. Uh, how it just came about? Yeah, it was just it. If you're on the right journey, just sort of these uh, places and these uh, stepping stones arrive for you. Like I say, when I quit the pizza parlor as a manager of Lampos Pizza in Fountain Valley, the tango arrived, and that was my next step. And so, and then you arrived in that situation, and then all the other psychics around me as I went through my day-to-day struggles trying to stay alive as an artist, but... You know, it was a really, it really was a journey. I, I worked at FedEx for a while, and so I thought, well, if this doesn't work out, I'll just go get a job at FedEx. So it was, it was more of a let's just challenge the universe to see what it brings me. Mm-hmm. So it was, uh, it was, it was fun. It was fun, even though you know, I, I was never f- frightened or thought I was a loser or I was going to give it up or anything. It was just. You go backpacking, just so it relates to backpacking in Europe. You go backpacking in Europe, basically you're homeless, right? You just mm-hmm. got your pack on your back, and it's a journey. And every day you wake up, and your your senses are alive, and you're living in the moment, and you're trying to figure out, well, in Europe you're thinking, how do I get from this place to that place? Or you're meeting people, and you're laughing, you're having a good time. At the end of the night, you got to go find a place to stay. So when I was living out of my car as an artist, it was just again, it was that kind of a journey. And Jack did that, too. He was in his van, and he traveled all over Europe and through cold weather and everything. So it's just, it's just, you just you're not afraid anymore. You just do it. Right. I think there was one point in time when you thought that, um, I remember you telling me about how you thought that all great artists had gone through a chapter of where they had um, lived um from a place of poverty, of course, not poverty consciousness, but actual financial poverty, and you felt as if you had this sense of kinship with other great artists that had suffered for their art and had been willing to give up material comfort in order to pursue art. And I think that's an, there's, an interesting, there's an interesting mindset difference that happens with an individual that realizes that they may not always have their creature comforts, but they have the comfort of knowing that they've done their life's work. So well, you pick, yeah, and you pick out these people that you really admire. I mean, you pick out like a Renoir or a Manet or a Van Gogh, and you just admire what they went through to create stuff. And again, all the impressionist stuff was really revolutionary and really radical back in the day. And so, as you go through this journey, you want you sort of in your mind imagination say. You want these guys to go, hey, you're doing okay, buddy. Way to go. <laughs> you know, we did it, you know. So way to go. I mean, you know, it's just – and you leave behind the legacy. You know, you're just leaving behind some really good stuff. But, mm-hmm. I, yeah, you always imagine that other artists who have gone through this journey, and it's sort of a – it's the artist's journey. And you just imagine them saying, okay, way to go. So, and those are the people you want to – those are the people you want to uh, – approve of what you're doing and want and you want to you want just that like to say imaginary peer group saying you know way to do it keep going hmm. so can i put you on the spot for a second sure no oh, thanks um so you and i worked together we we became friends we worked together but basically we were co-workers for a lot of years at what point did it shift for you and you realized that you know, I was a source of inspiration because my story is is that I was 16 years old. I wanted to be I wanted to be a psychic. I wanted to be a muse, and I wanted to drive a Citroen. And I never say that word correctly, but anyway, I wanted to be. Um, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a psychic as my profession, and I wanted to be an artist muse. 
and I was forever on the hunt trying to find the right artist who was going to see me as their inspiration. So how did that sort of unfold for you? It's a very personal question. I've never asked you that. I think it was... <laughs> no, how many times? So I'd go in there, right? And you'd, and you'd sit down at the easel at the beginning of the night, and you don't have any idea what you wanted to paint, and you always paint what you love, or you always paint something that you find really interesting or something that would keep your attention. How many times did I paint you before we got together as a, as, as a wow. couple? Wow. So I'd look over at her, and she was, and she got really dressed up. I mean, I, the first time I recognized her without uh, being in in costume, basically, <laughs> I didn't. I, you know, I didn't sort of recognize her. I was like, okay, is this you? You know, she would just walk through the mall dressed normally. But no, she would look really. I'm thinking about her right now. So yeah, she, she would sit at. She had this nice little zone all to herself. She had a table with all their crystals and rocks and all sorts of stuff on the table, and she would be dressed really nice. And she'd be sitting in a chair waiting for her customers to come along to have a conversation with her. So she just looked really intriguing to me, and you know, sort of, I guess, I don't think mysterious is the word, but it's just, yeah, it was just beautiful. It looked beautiful to me. She had hmm. always had nice colors on. And she just looked inviting, you know. She's sitting there smiling at people going by, and yeah, it was just quite a it was quite a scene. And then it had a really deeper meaning because you'd picture looking at her as being like one of the clients coming up. Well, tell me about my, you know, give me a psychic reading or tell me the deeper thing about what's going on in my life right now. So it had many layers to me. And people have bought her paintings, <laughs> you know. People have bought paintings of the. Uh, Images I did of Suzanne at the tango, and she was the tango. She was she was the uh, again many levels, many levels. It was food, it was entertainment, it was people. But she brought. But when they brought in psychics, it just brought a whole another dimension to the whole atmosphere because there was a deeper sort of a conversation going on, more real than just the bar talk and just people, you know, socializing. So yeah, it was it was a many leveled experience. But yeah, just to see her sitting there it was just I I loved it. Oh. Hmm. 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 That's great. That. <laughs> That's a great story. I've never I've never asked you that. So that is a really great um way to put you sort of on the spot and um So T J if you want I, Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I was just <laughs> I think you were, you and I were thinking the same thing. But you, you, what were you saying? If TJ, if you want to ask a question, what was that? Do you want, do you want to take and have Rich and Jack talk to each other, and then you be the one to sort of um, take that conversation to the places you want it to go? Because I've listened to these stories since forever. And maybe maybe you can bring some fresh material to the uh, conversation. Yeah, because I'd love to weave this together for Ace Folk Life because okay. I believe the legacy of uh, all of us evolves with time. And this belongs to the United States of America and the brand Ace Folk Life. And we can endorse those that we choose to be our friends and members that are real trustworthy. It's like, uh, you know, we're helping starving artists, but right now so many people with COVID-19 around the world like us, you mm. know, we're barely getting by to pay our bills. And this is a hard time for our entertainers and our authors and our artists. So I'd like to uh, spin this in a direction that Jack knows how to survive through the hard times as an artist, mm -hmm. and maybe between him and Rich, they can talk about inspiring the world and why the Ace Folk Life as a, a society and an association of artists, visual and performing artists, artists and authors should should support each other. You think that'd be a good family thing? Because my husband can no longer speak, but this was one of his desires and wishes. And we were doing festivals in Ohio County, and we got started with 
helping people that 